Chapter 31 Rachel Visits Rachel was on the phone. She had seen the invitation. Jax, I must see this exhibit, she said earnestly, her words tumbling out. I've waited so long, and now all the pieces are coming together. The excitement in your eyes, the little log homes. I knew it had to be some kind of fairy world, but I thought maybe you had created miniature robots. I had no idea you had miniaturized life. I said you would be the first to know, Jax assured her. You can also be the first to see. Meet me at my office door right now if you have the time. I'll be there, she said without any hesitation. Evan and Jax looked at one another with a strange mixture of delight and anxiety as the professor ended the call. They were about to share their secret with their very first guest. Well, we'll see how this goes, Jax smiled, heading toward the viewing hall through the elevator entrance. Evan followed. Rachel was standing outside the office door, still dressed in her work uniform. Her bright blue eyes were filled with great anticipation, but she didn't say a word. Jax Lemons held the door open for her and ushered her in. This is the viewing hall, he told her proudly. This is where all the scientists will come to study human life in ideal circumstances. Holding her hands up to her face in eager anticipation, Rachel followed Jax and Evan to the window that framed Paradise. It had an excellent view of the dome from the northern end toward the lake. Here is paradise, Jax told her, gesturing toward the tinies that were working hard on their solar oven experiments. Astonished, Rachel could hardly believe what she saw. It's magnificent, she said. Jax, what a project! It blows my mind! No wonder you've been so consumed all these years. No wonder you don't take holidays. No, I don't need to go anywhere. My little family is right here. Swallowing hard and rubbing her face with her hands, Rachel realized voices and laughter were coming over the speakers. I hear them, she laughed. This is unbelievable. So who is everyone, she begged. What are they doing? Are they happy? Of course they are happy, Jax replied. How could they not be happy? Yes, yes, of course, she chided herself, still in disbelief that what she was seeing was actually real. That's what all this is about, isn't it? Happy human life. The tinies are making solar ovens right now, Evan replied. He pointed to the elder tiny who was helping Odin with his project. Uncle Louis is the oldest, he began. He's the teacher and the mentor and the parent. He has all those roles, Rachel questioned. Well... We would have liked to have had an Aunt Loretta, and maybe a few more to assist him, Jax chuckled. But our early process wasn't as successful as the second attempt. Oh, I see, she said. Louis is helping Odin, Evan continued. He is our least happy tiny, easily frustrated and very quick to find fault and lay blame. But Odin has also been the first to defend against danger. He's courageous, I'll give him that. Looking in closely, Jax added, Nancy was helping him, but I don't see her at the moment. She's super reliable, organizes the store, and oversees all the meals. Suddenly, Nancy ran out of the store and called out for Uncle Louie. The oven isn't working, she wailed. It won't turn on, Uncle Louie. How will I bake the bread for lunch? Oh, dear. This is not good timing, Jax lamented. I'll go check the fuses, Evan offered, running toward the supply room to take the elevator downstairs. You fix their problems right away? Rachel inquired. Of course, Jax replied. My goal is to minimize suffering and give them the happiest lives possible. But what about the joy that comes from human ingenuity? Rachel prodded. With a frown, Jax looked over at her. What do you mean? Well, feeling useful and discovering solutions to our own problems brings great joy, especially if we are successful, she elaborated. The Jewish people are more resilient and creative because we have suffered so much. We expect difficulties. We rise to embrace challenges. Wouldn't it be better to leave the oven broken for a while and give them the opportunity to overcome and find their own solution? Think of how much satisfaction that will bring. Ooh la la, I knew you should have been on our team from the beginning, Jax chuckled. You have unique insights, Rachel. Why wasn't I? she asked perturbed. I've been on your team for everything that's gone on in the biosphere. I've always supported you. Jack swallowed hard and turned to look at her. Rachel's face had clouded over with disappointment. 
I would have loved to have been involved with this from the very beginning, she implored tragically. This is such an amazing project, Jax. I would give my heart to this. Breathing deeply, Jax gently explained, Rachel, I don't know how the world will react to this project. There may be a terrible backlash. It may be misunderstood, maligned, portrayed as an evil infringement on human rights, or, or even a criminal abuse of my scientific privileges. The disappointment faded. Jax added, Evan and I decided to shelter you from being an accomplice. You knew nothing, so you can't be held accountable for anything we have done. That's why. Rachel nodded gratefully. I understand, she said, patting his arm. Thanks for thinking that through. I suppose the ethics committee will have something to say about it all, she smiled, once they sort out what to do with the miniaturization project. With deep yearning, she looked back toward the tinies. The dean is coming tomorrow, Jax relayed. I'm sure the ethics committee won't be far behind. I really, really hope it goes well, she stated sincerely. These are little human beings, she considered. She heard them offer various suggestions for lunch. The board might be really upset, but they can't shut this down. A lanky, dark-haired young man was coming forward to Uncle Louis. We finished our box oven, he said eagerly. We can bake a loaf of bread in it and share. Maybe if everyone gets their cookers working, we might not even need the big oven anymore. See the delight in his eyes, Rachel pointed out. That young man has a solution. He feels like he's saved the day. What greater joy is there than that? They watched as Nancy brought out a ball of dough and gave it to Zaheer. He ran to place it in his oven. Evan came running back to the viewing hall with a miniature coil in his hand. The element has burned out, he told them. But we have a spare. I'll just run back down and fix it. Putting his hand up, Jack stopped him. Actually, Professor replied, Rachel had a good suggestion. Let's leave the oven unfixed for a week and give the tinies the opportunity to solve the problem themselves. With surprise, Evan considered the idea. Well, it is good timing that they're all working on solar ovens at the moment. It, it will be even more incentive to finish the projects. Jax agreed. By the way, he informed Rachel, that young man with the good solution is Zaheer. Zaheer, Rachel smiled. What a lovely Arabic name. Farouk will be impressed. With a pleased expression, Jax hoped Rachel's husband would be just as supportive as his wife. A pretty girl with copper-brown hair ran over to Uncle Louis to share her idea. I can fry the rest of the bread today, she offered eagerly. The stovetop is still working. Between the solar cooker and the frying pan, we'll make enough bread for lunch. When Uncle Louis praised her idea, Amy proudly entered the store to do her part. No one would starve. She has spunk, Rachel smiled. That's Amy, Jax relayed. She and Zaheer are also the best singers and songwriters. She spends her evenings caring for the squirrels, rabbits, and deer. Oh, I love her already, Rachel laughed. And they are singers? Jax nodded. I would love to hear their songs. I'll send you one, he promised. One by one, the two researchers told Rachel all the names of the tinies. It was easy to point out the four who were huddled around Zaheer's cooker, and the rest who were lined up at the store to get their fried bread. When all the tinies had eaten lunch and raved about the new taste sensations, they departed to the various afternoon activities. Rachel realized it was time to feed the seals. As they made their way back to the office door, the animal doctor pleaded, Jax, I want to be involved with this project as much as I can. If there are any medical needs, Farouk and I will gladly assist. And I can't wait to bring Jordan. He will love this. Jordan was Rachel's five-year-old son. We hope to open up to the public next month, the professor told her. Jordan can come as often as you like once everything's on display. Chapter 32, The Ethics Committee Lima was wrestling Damien, and Santa was cheering them on. Vanitha and Georgia were chatting about new designs for pottery. Charlie was teaching Bojo how to roll over. Emma and Rusty were barking and chasing each other around the schoolhouse. Odin was running to the outhouse with furtive backward glances. 
Amy had finished helping Nancy and Milan clean up for breakfast, and it was time for school to begin. Peering through the viewing window on the other side were three stern members of the Greenville University Governing and Ethics Committee who had come along with Fred Hoffman. While the Tonys were enjoying another pleasant morning in paradise, the professor was answering a lot of hard questions from an intense group of astonished but livid fellow researchers. There was solid consensus that approval, if it had been sought, would never have been granted for such a radical research project. They were certain that Professor LeMann's decision to start miniaturizing humans and animals without first seeking and gaining permission from the Research Ethics Committee was likely criminal. No one could see any hope for Jacques LeMann's avoiding prosecution, let alone remaining a university faculty member. Even if he was the president of the biosphere and had donated half the funds to construct the mammoth greenhouse complex, he was deeply in trouble. While the accusations raged on in the viewing hall, those inside the dome laughed and chatted happily. The Tinies had no idea that the mastermind of paradise was standing alone, arguing fervently to maintain the management position of their existence and share his findings with the world. He was on his own because he had told Evan not to join him for this first encounter. Jack's Lemans wanted to take full responsibility. Inside the dome, Uncle Louie began the school day. Okay, everyone, he said. With the main oven still not working, it's more important than ever to get our solar projects ready. Zaheer and Lily produced an excellent loaf yesterday. It may not have been fully cooked inside, he said, with a smile in their direction. But with a little more practice, we'll all get it right. If you're making a box oven, see if you can finish it today. Go get your materials. Kenzie was the first to pick up his oven, which she and Amy had finished the day before, but not in time to bake a loaf. Amy ran to the store to get one of the balls of dough that Nancy had needed before breakfast. Without any hot bread that morning, everyone had filled up on leftover honey buns, fresh fried fish, and eggs. Fahid and Tina were still working on their larger, more complicated design, but they joined Kenzie and Amy for the test. The box ovens had been much simpler to create. Carrying the project, Kenzie led them to the wide open meadow where the sunshine was uninhibited by any leafy trees or shadows. Opening the glass lid, he held it up while Amy placed a fragrant round ball of dough inside on a black pan. Closing the lid carefully, the pale-skinned, freckled young man positioned the box, making sure the top foil-covered pieces of cardboard focused the sunshine deep inside. How long do you think it will take, he asked, not having any baking experience. Amy shrugged. We'll have to keep checking on it. So here and Lily waited a long time and it still wasn't done. Then let's go help the others finish, Kenzie said. Okay, I'll be the bread checker, Amy offered. With a cheery hello, they walked past Sahir and Lily, who were putting in their second ball of dough, and Georgie and Ponce, who had given up on the parabolic cooker and were now measuring for a box oven. France and Charlie were positioning the reflective sides on their oven to increase the heat on the loaf Dia had inserted. Santa and Lima were practicing a new dance move for the show they planned to put on, and they hadn't finished cutting out the cardboard pieces. Bringing over a few sheets of foil from the store deck, Amy heard a loud argument break out among Odin's group as the stocky, unreasonable tiny refused to follow the printed instructions. Damien looked up in her direction and shrugged his shoulders helplessly. Nancy rolled her eyes. You are the worst of the whooshes! Odin yelled, tossing his knife in frustration. It hit the glass beside them, shattering the surface. Nancy cried out in dismay. Stop using that word, you rolling tumbler, Damien retorted, especially when you don't even know what it means. You broke our lid, Nancy yelled, reaching out to pick up a shard of glass and cutting her finger. Ouch! Uncle Louis heard the glass shatter and called out, Careful, that will be sharp! But he was too late. Kenzie saw a pail on the store deck and ran to get it so they could collect the broken pieces. For a few minutes, Kenzie and Amy helped pick up the sharp fragments, while Tina found the first aid kit and bandaged Nancy's finger. Once the accident had been cleaned up, they heard Georgia disagreeing with Ponzi over the length of the cardboard. Franz was arguing with Thea. I'll chuck the bread, Amy said. Kenzie came with her. Some people work great together, he observed, looking around, and others do not. And then there are some people who seem to work well with everyone. Like who? Amy asked. Well, like Sahir, Kenzie told her with a nod in his friend's direction. He's nice to almost everybody. Yes, he is, 
Amy agreed slowly. I think all of the guys had a turn fishing with him in the mornings, except maybe Damien. Milan hasn't either, she added, as he stooped down to look through the glass at their bread. But then he's always getting breakfast ready, I guess. True. Kitchen crew misses out on a lot of the morning activities. And the afternoon ones, Kenzie nodded sympathetically. You would have enjoyed putting the xylophone together. Yes, I would have, Amy agreed, standing up. The bread wasn't quite ready. But no one invited me to help. Kenzie frowned. I thought Georgia did, he said slowly, as they headed back to the group. And you said you were too busy. No one asked me, Amy stated with dismay. Oh, he remarked in surprise. Then he gently chided. Well, you could have invited yourself. Looking distraught, Amy didn't answer. She hadn't considered that option. Quickly, Kenzie changed the subject. They were within hearing range of George's group. Zaheer took Odin out again today, he relayed. Odin actually caught two fish this morning. He was so excited. Tina and Zaheer were working very quietly on their cooker when their teammates returned. Amy and Kenzie picked up the new sheets of foil and began wrapping them around the cardboard pieces. Troubled inside, Amy wondered if Georgia had pretended to have invited her to help and then lied about her response. Angrily, she looked over at the beautiful blonde girl. What a betrayal. What a terrible friend. Dislike turned to hate. The others continued talking about all the stones Odin had traded for food that still needed to be taken up Rainbow Hill. Vahid asked Amy about them. Brought back to some happier thoughts, Amy explained the plans they had for a patio. And I heard that Dia made some requests, Kenzie smiled. Forcing a smile of her own, Amy nodded. She wants stone chairs and a table on the patio. She's made Odin and Ponzi two sets of clothes to trade. Returning every so often to check on the bread, Amy gradually dismissed the dark misgivings she had toward Georgia. After all, it was true that she was busy helping with dinner while the others worked on the xylophone. As much as she would have loved to have helped, it would have meant letting Nancy and Milan down. She knew how much they needed her, and she liked to be needed. It was a beautiful sunny day. Franz and Charlie took out a perfect golden loaf ahead of all the others. Uncle Louie was very impressed with the reflectors they had added. Emma and Rusty were running back and forth investigating every rabbit hole and deer footprint. Amy's group was steadily putting together a large parabolic cooker, and Kenzie entertained his group with stories of the chickens and the sheep. He had plans with Uncle Louie to shear the sheep. Apparently, Benita thought she could use the wool to make pretty rugs and crafts. Having never heard that wool could be taken off animals while they were still alive, Amy had plenty of questions. Tina and Vahid made a few comments, and the time went fast. After the fourth check on the bread, Amy shouted, It's brown! It's ready! Using sticks to pry open the lid, Kenzie cautioned, It's going to be hot. Don't get too close. Steam poured out of the box. They had to wait a few minutes for it to cool down. While they waited, they watched Zaheer and Lily open their oven. Hot air came pouring out of theirs as well. Great job, Lily, Zaheer exclaimed. I'm sure this loaf is done. However, Lily reached in before Zaheer could stop her and burned her hand. She wailed in pain. Tina ran to get the first aid kit. Ponce and Uncle Louie ran over to comfort the petite girl. Remembering how painful burns were, Amy was very sympathetic to Lily's tears. She and Kenzie knelt close by as Tina opened up the kit. A small bottle of burn remedy was inside. Uncle Louis suggested they put some on Lily's red sore and put a bandage on top of that. By the time Lily was all fixed up, the bread was cool enough in both ovens to take out. The tasty loaves were shared around. Aside from the shattered glass, a bleeding finger, and a burned hand, Jack Slamans was thankful the Dean and Ethics Committee had seen an industrious morning. After two hours of wrangling, Harsh accusations, apologies, and explanations, they had reluctantly given the professor approval to open the doors for viewing, as long as he openly admitted his unprofessional conduct in failing to seek approval and permission before embarking on such an endeavor. Much concern had been raised about the sustainability of paradise, and further committee meetings were planned to consider all the questionable ethics involved. He had been severely reprimanded for using donated genetic material to produce actual children and for not having a proper committee in place to oversee all the important aspects of the tiny's development. He was absolutely forbidden to extend the project with another generation. Enormous fines were looming, and his teaching career was likely over once he had finished the semester. 
However, no one had suggested taking him away in handcuffs. Evan had yet to face the ethics committee's review of his assistance, but the onus of blame was squarely leveled at and accepted by the professor. When the dean and committee members left the room, Jack sat down at his desk and thought long and hard. He was very disappointed by the harsh reactions and anxious about the consequences. However, he was thankful that he was allowed to share his research and maintain the little lives he'd already brought into being. Once he had calmed down, he phoned his loyal assistant and explained what had been said. An hour later, he met Rachel in the hallway and relayed the outcome to her, reconfirming that it was a very good thing she had not been involved. Then returning to his desk, Jack Slaman sat down with grim determination. Adding a full admission of his unprofessional conduct to his digital invitation, he sent it out to his colleagues all around the world. Chapter 33, Constraint Triangles. The 5.30 news report woke the professor Thursday morning, as it did every day. A horrendous shooting had taken place at a kindergarten in Israel. An armed terrorist disguised as a police officer had burst into a small Jewish school and killed 40 children in less than 20 minutes. Salors! All those precious, innocent lives, the professor exclaimed, sitting bolt upright in bed. This is shocking. How could this happen? His second thought was, I hope none of them are related to Rachel. He knew her relatives lived close by the terrorized town. He sent off a message to the Khalids just to be sure. Then he felt a wave of relief that Paradise was safe from such aggressive hatred and persecution. There were still two and a half weeks before exams, perhaps the last set of exams the professor would ever hold. Many students in his Foundations in Molecular Biology and Genetics class were talking about the mass shooting that morning as they walked in. How could God let this happen? One student bemoaned. Those poor innocent children, they didn't do anything wrong. Why are you blaming God? Seth asked. Well, if I was God, another student interjected, I would have stopped that man. Did God make the gun? Seth asked. Another student answered, You're always defending God and blaming people, but you say God made us. God gave us intelligence and physical abilities, Seth argued, but we choose whether to use our gifts to help others or to harm them. Why did he give anyone the desire to hurt someone else? God did not create us this way, Seth reminded him. We have fallen from our very good state. Kale spoke up. Seth, if your God has all the power in the world, he should be able to stop the really bad things from happening. Would you want to be restricted by God to only do good? Seth asked her. Would you want him to intervene all day long, barring you from eating junk food or watching things that you shouldn't, and only allow you to read the Bible in your free time? Do you appreciate it when your parents intervene? But if he is so intelligent and really wants us to be good, another student piped up, then he should have given us a good only free will. If he let us become bad, he can hardly blame us from doing wrong. Seth smiled at the concept, but he disagreed with the conclusion. He had spent hours working on an article which he hoped to give to the professor. If you have free will to do good, then you also have the free will to do bad, he explained. Once again, he reminded the others that Adam and Eve had chosen to partake of the tree of good and evil, unleashing the struggle all people have faced ever since. He also tried to explain free will, keeping an eye on the professor, who seemed deeply distracted by his phone. At some point, Seth knew the classroom conversation would be shut down. God decided to allow us to make our own choices, he told the others. It's not because he can't control us, but because he wants us to decide who we want to be. However, God will hold us accountable for our actions. One day he will intervene and judge whether we've done good or bad. If we've chosen to do good now and ask forgiveness for our failures, then he will take away all our desire to do wrong. Kylie was frowning. Don't you see? Seth tried to explain. The good only option has been in God's mind from the beginning, but it's our reward for overcoming and making right choices now. 
He wants to know who really loves him. This is a great way to test us. Up at the front, messaging with Rachel on his phone, the professor was rather distracted from the class discussion. The animal doctor had replied to say that she was grieved for all the innocent children and their families and thankful that none of them were close relatives, but she did know several who were involved. She had then listed out some of the sad situations that were being relayed to her. Distressed, Jax had attempted to reply with some comforting words. Eventually, he noticed the time on his phone and asked everyone to take a seat. This is your world, he reminded his class, having only heard snippets of their conversation. You need to fix the problems you see. Don't sit around waiting for some god to make the world a safe, fair place to live. It won't happen. Science is the only way to knowledge and truth. Seth frowned. The professor had just made an untestable assumption. There was no way to prove that science is the only way to knowledge and truth. Yet feeling that he had stirred things up enough for one day, Seth kept quiet. As Professor LeMans launched into another lesson on DNA transcription, everyone settled down to take extensive notes. With exams fast approaching, every detail was important. Once the lesson was over and the students began streaming out of the room, Seth waited till he was the only one left. Pulling his article out of his bag, he hesitantly approached the professor who was now standing by the door as the students filed out. I have something I'd like to show you, he began. With annoyance, the professor looked over. The tall, red-headed student stood in front of him, holding out some stapled pages. Seth was not his favorite student, regardless of the diligent effort he put into his studies. Feeling pressed for time and weighed down by disappointment and grief, Jax was barely polite. What is it? he snapped. With a deep breath, Seth pointed to his stapled report. We've had some interesting discussions in your class, he began nervously. There is never much time to explain my reasons for choosing to believe in God, so I've compiled some of the most important. Disdainfully, the professor asked, You want me to read this? Please, sir. Seth begged, with a beseeching look in his green eyes. I put it together for your benefit. Even though this goes against your worldview, I think it's worth your consideration. Why? Because if if God exists, then there is an opportunity to live forever in a perfect world without suffering. I know this is what you want, sir. I hate for you to miss out. And if he doesn't exist, then you're not missing out on anything you don't already have. Professor raised an eyebrow. Quoting Mark Twain, he said, Faith is believing what you know ain't so. No, Seth disagreed. Faith is not an excuse to avoid thinking or evaluating evidence. You have faith in Evan because he has proved himself trustworthy. What I'm giving you is the evidence for why I have faith in a trustworthy creator. Some supernatural claims, I suppose? Only in the sense that nothing in nature could have created our universe. A mind was required, outside of nature, to bring our world into being. That's what makes our creation supernatural. Professor didn't answer. In a pleading tone, Seth reasoned, Considering this evidence might waste 15 minutes of your day, but it also might add something priceless to your life. All right, the professor grumbled, too busy to argue. He held out his hand to take the papers. Just one more minute, please, sir, Seth begged. I'd like to explain something that helps me understand the unfairness you think you see in our world. The professor groaned. If you insist, but only a minute. Seth pointed to the triangle on the cover of his stapled article. At the top vertex of the triangle was the word cost. On the left vertex was the word quality. On the bottom right was the word time. Just imagine for a second that you are a producer of the best microscopes in the world, Seth began. Rolling his eyes, the professor could hardly believe he was subjecting himself to this discussion. Undaunted, Seth continued. As a producer, you can only pick two of these constraints at a time. If a customer emailed you with an order for the highest quality microscope, but wanted them delivered by next week, you might tell them that a high quality microscope takes your company three weeks to assemble for $4,000. If he had to have a microscope by next week, you might say that you will have to employ overtime staff and perhaps even hire an extra employee to get the job done. There may also be some parts that you will need to express order, all of which will increase the price of the microscope to $8,000, but then you could get it delivered by next week. 
If your customer said, sorry, but I can't pay any more than 4000 for the microscope, but I must have it by next week, you might tell them, then you will need to settle for a microscope of lesser quality. I can produce a substandard microscope by next week for $4,000, but it won't have our five-star rating. The professor looked up at Seth with an annoyed expression. I understand this perfectly, he said with a dismissive wave of his hand. If he wants it to be of high quality and will only pay 4000 then he can't have it next week. Of course, it's impossible to meet all three constraints simultaneously. Great, I'm glad you understand, Seth smiled. He pointed to the triangle at the bottom of the page. At the top were the words, human free will. On the left-hand side was printed, loving community, and on the right was, life for everyone. Here again, Seth said, pointing to the triangle, only two constraints are possible at any one time. Of course God wants everyone to live, he has said this in the Bible. And of course he wants us all to love one another, he has said this clearly as well. His son Jesus commanded us to love one another. God also wants us to have free will, the ability to make our own decisions. He doesn't want us to be robots that mindlessly follow commands. God wants us to choose to follow him. But in giving us free will, not all humans will choose to love and obey good rules. Some are hateful and selfish and only care about themselves. Those people destroy loving communities. So if God wants to give us free will and have a loving community, then some must be excluded. Professor Lemans pondered the matter. Why can't God arrange loving communities to include everyone? Well, Seth answered, covering over the word free will on the triangle, in order to have a loving world where everyone gets to live, God would have to remove free will. He looked up at the professor with a smile. If God made us as loving, obedient robots, everyone could live and we would have a loving community. Moving his hand off the page, Seth continued, But if God wants to give us free will and allow everyone to live, then unfortunately the world is not going to be a completely loving and happy place. This is the world we live in today. Covering over the words, loving community, Seth said, do you see what I mean? The professor nodded slowly, considering the information, especially in relation to his dome full of tinies. He extrapolated further. So you're saying that in order to have a loving world and give everyone free will, we would have to remove the option for everyone to live in it. In other words, those that go against the loving community would have to be removed in some way. Exactly, Seth replied. So those who choose not to follow God's ways and develop his character will have to be removed from the loving community. And when God takes away the curse, the earth will be full of loving people who will live forever. Shaking his head disdainfully, the professor remarked, Who would want to live forever anyway? You wouldn't? No, no, this life is good enough for me. Pausing for a moment, Seth disagreed. I've heard that C.S. Lewis said that to not appreciate God's offer of immortality is to be like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he can't imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the seaside. You've enjoyed the blessings of intelligence, creativity, and your five senses in this life, sir. You know how wonderful it is to be in God's image, but you and I have no concept of what it will be like to share God's nature, the professor replied a little kindlier, taking the stapled pages. You've given me something to consider, and I do appreciate your effort to bring this to my attention. I will consider your reasons to believe in God, but right now I have some very important things to do. I understand, Seth nodded respectfully. Thanks for your time. As Seth walked out of the room, the professor closed the door and hurried down the hall. In the back of his mind, he mulled over the idea of the constraint triangle. He had considered this dilemma vaguely more than once, but now he saw it clearly. What if all the tinies in paradise were like Odin and Ponzi, he pondered. Would I want to continue this experiment? Would I find any joy in observing them or showing them off to others? He had to admit to himself that he wouldn't. In fact, he had occasionally trifled with the idea that paradise might be better off if he removed the grumblers and complainers. But I wouldn't kill them, he assured himself. I'd simply put them in the nursery. That thought soothed his troubled conscience. He could still feel he was doing a better job than any god figure.
Chapter 34. Chest Pains Lying in bed that night, Professor LeMans picked up the stapled report that Seth had handed him after class. Attached to the page with the constraint triangles was a chart with various reasons to believe in a creator. Disdainfully, the professor shook his head as he glanced at the title. Ten reasons to believe in God, he read out loud with a chuckle. That's all he could come up with. My book has much more to the contrary than these few pages. The first point considered the design of planet Earth and the solar system. Skimming over the phrases, perfect distance from the Earth, life-giving water, finely tuned atmosphere and gravity, the professor wondered if Seth's article would reveal anything new. I know this, my boy, he lamented, much, much better than you do. Of course this planet is perfectly suited to support life, or life wouldn't have evolved upon it. Impatiently, he looked briefly at the next detail and muttered, Oh, yes, water is essential and has amazing properties. I don't disagree. And the brain is a vastly more complex computer than man will ever design. Continuing on, he muttered, You're right, Seth. Humans didn't invent mathematics. They discovered mathematics from investigating the natural world. Math is complex and perfect and consistent. This is true. Perhaps not what one would expect from blind chance and random mutation, but that's just the way it came about. Irreducible complexity did catch the professor's eye. At the very back of his mind, he did occasionally question if the complex machines found in living organisms could have evolved when the key components of these molecular machines had to evolve simultaneously and as perfectly functional units in order to work and make their existence possible. Okay, très bien, we'll give you that one, he said generously, as though he were marking a test. The reference to DNA made him swallow hard. I'm very well aware of the complexity of DNA, he mumbled. It's what I study and teach. Nevertheless, the reference to the four-dimensional genome caused some consternation. Professor LeMans picked up his smartphone and googled the words four-dimensional genome. An article popped up by a well-known scientist who was leading the way in genetic research. The professor read his name with a frown and a dismissive wave of his hand. He had heard of this scientist, but he had never been interested in following his work. He's a creationist, he sighed. How can he teach me anything? Yet the professor listened to the first video clip online, which led him to read a few extensive articles. He shivered. Never before had he heard such strong evidence against evolution. Rather shaken, he skimmed through pre-programmed instincts in living creatures. He had to admit it was hard to argue against the magnetic GPS systems in migratory creatures. Googling magnetic GPS migration, he clicked on the first article. Many of these creatures never have the opportunity to learn the migratory routes from their parents, he read, skimming through the paragraphs. Monarch butterflies only migrate in the fourth generation. Turtles hatch without their parents anywhere close by and immediately head to the water and swim to very specific places. The same places generation after generation. Salmon spawn in the same riverbeds where they were hatched and then die, leaving their young to swim back to the ocean on their own and then repeat the process. How can this be? Professor LeMans admitted to himself that it was hard to accept that such an accurate and complex mutation had occurred in so many different animals, insects, birds, and reptiles. After all, they were creatures that hadn't evolved one from another. All their GPS systems work perfectly from birth, he muttered to himself. And yes, they are remarkably similar. He shook his head, unable to explain how each unique creature passed accurate GPS abilities onto its offspring without being there to guide them. There was no doubt this was a perplexing point. But, given millions of years of evolution, anything is possible, he assured himself. Reading quickly over the complexity of the Bible and the enormous impact of Jesus Christ, Professor LeMans felt distressed. He hadn't realized the Bible shared the same complex fingerprint of master design that all creation demonstrated, and he was perturbed with the strong evidence that Jesus Christ had once lived on the earth. He could hardly argue against the fact that Jesus Christ was an historical figure. And he is a leader that lovingly served his followers, he murmured with astonishment, reading the words on Seth's article. Why, 
That's servant leadership. For a moment, he proudly reflected on the admirable servant leadership that Louis had shown in paradise. Louis has been a wonderful leader, he thought to himself, because he serves the tinies in a loving fashion. He always internalized the many helpful articles they sent him online. Then his heart missed a beat. How did Jesus know anything about this concept 2,000 years ago? Surely Jesus didn't initiate this philosophy, did he? Googling origin of servant leadership, Jax was relieved that most articles attributed the philosophy to Robert Greenleaf, who'd credited a book he'd read called Journey to the East. Some articles referred to a Chinese philosopher named Laozi way back in the 5th century BC, and very few mentioned the Bible. However, when he typed in, is servant leadership based on the Bible?, He discovered that other experts readily affirmed that biblical teachings were the true source of servant leadership. The professor had another disconcerting thought. What if my first little man had been Odin? Or France? How would they have treated the other tinies? Would they have diligently followed servant leadership principles? Professor Lemann shuddered as he realized, Ooh la la, this project would have turned into a complete nightmare. Turning off the light, Jax had plenty to ponder. It took me four years of intense research and design to build paradise, he reflected. And I only had to resolve one major issue in my environment, the right balance of oxygen in the atmosphere. I harnessed the sun that was already there. I hooked up pipes and a tap for the life-giving water that was freely available. And I made the most of everything else that was already in place. Yes, reproduction was difficult, as I had to discover how to miniaturize the tiny developing embryos and build special incubators in which they could form. That all took a great deal of research, money, and time. But the universal solvent properties of water, the four-dimensional human genome, the ability of the cells to multiply and differentiate into organs, and the incredible human brain. I can't take credit for any of that. Paradise, he reflected anxiously isn't really my creation. A cricket chirp interrupted his reflections. Picking up his phone, Professor LeMans checked his notifications. Had the incoming message been from anyone in his own world, he would have left it to answer in the morning. But the message was from Louis. Any notification from Louis was considered urgent. Can we have a chat? The text said. Certainly, the professor typed, turning his light back on. What's happening? I haven't wanted to say much about this, Louis texted in return, but I'm getting pain in my chest, especially when I exert myself. I looked online and realized I may have early signs of heart failure. Pressing the White Dove app, the professor dialed Louis for a video call. When the connection went through, the professor smiled kindly and said, Hi there, son. Hi, Louis replied wearily, his face lined with distress. Sorry to trouble you this late at night. You know you can always talk to me any time of the night, the professor assured him kindly. After all his reflections that evening, he felt a deeper appreciation for his first amazing little man. I I know you struggle to find time and keep our communication out of the limelight, he empathized. And I feel for you. Chest pains are concerning. How often do you get these feelings? Whenever I exert myself, Louis repeated, stroking his white beard. Even climbing Rainbow Hill is an effort now, and I have trouble catching my breath. I'll talk to a medical expert tomorrow, the professor promised. I'll ensure you get the help that you need. There may be some medication we can send in for you. I've done some investigation online, Louis said, with a measure of alarm in his troubled dark eyes. And I'm scared this might be serious. It seems I may have blocked arteries, which requires surgery. Is that correct? There is blockage in your arteries or a weak valve. Surgery may be the answer, the professor agreed, nodding slowly, wondering if this was a viable option for a tiny. However, chest pains can be due to other causes, he said with greater assurance than he felt. Medicine, change of diet or activity may resolve your pains. Don't get too anxious about this right now. Let's wait for the medical professional to determine what is wrong. I don't want to die, Louis said bravely, his eyes anxious. Is there something you can do to reverse this aging process? Suddenly emotional, the professor felt a lump in his throat. Louis had been alive for nearly 65 months. He hoped his first little man would reach at least 70. Gently, he relayed, not that I've discovered yet. 
Your experiments on Rosa haven't produced any promising results? The professor hesitated to tell Louis the details of his experimentation on Rosa. The cryonics process wasn't particularly comforting, and he didn't want Louis to look it up online. The experiment will take a lot more time, he explained kindly. We are carefully preserving her until we find a way to give her back life. So I may not see her again in my lifetime? Swallowing hard, the professor nodded. Louis pleaded earnestly, Is there any way to speed up the experiment? My life has been so short, and these teenagers still need me. They will be devastated if I'm not here anymore. Who will communicate with you? Who will lead them? What if they turn against each other? Please don't let me die. I'm not God, the professor started to say, and then he stopped abruptly. Louis was shocked. I thought God was a delusion, he objected sharply. Isn't that what your book said? Why did you say that? Oh, la, la, it's, it's just a figure of speech, Louis, the professor replied with a nervous chuckle, shaking his head. I don't know why I said that. God is a delusion. But sometimes people say I'm not God, meaning that they can't do the impossible, because what some people say God does is actually impossible. Seeing the confused look on Louis's face, the professor decided to abandon his jumbled explanation. With sincere emotion, he assured his first honey, Look, Louis, I love you with all of my heart. You've been the most faithful son I could ever ask for. I will get the best doctor I know to examine you and make a diagnosis. If there is anything that we can do to extend your life, I will spare no expense to do so. Louis nodded gratefully. Now listen to me, the professor encouraged. There is no reason to lie awake wondering how the tinies will cope without you. You've lived a good, healthy life. Don't expect the worst. I hope you will have many good months ahead of you. But for now, just to be on the safe side, I will send in a blood pressure monitor with instructions on how to use it. And get the young guys to do all the hard work from now on. Don't exert yourself. Teach everyone first aid responses and CPR. Explain a heart attack to them and how to save a life. Do whatever you can now. I will, Louis said, looking more confident. They've finished the biology course and are ready for first aid. With a pause, he added, Whatever happens to me, I have thoroughly enjoyed the last seven months here in paradise. They've been everything I could ever ask for. With sincere emotion, Louis said, Thank you, Father. He used a special name that the professor had asked to be called. And good night. Good night. I love you, Louis, the professor said in great anguish. When the screen went black, he laid his phone down beside him. Tears welled up in his eyes. He hoped the chest pains were not a result of blocked arteries. Losing Louis would be as tragic as losing his first family. I will consult with Dr. Khalid first thing in the morning, he promised himself, thankful that Farouk's wife already knew about the project. Let's hope he has some medication that will work. Rachel's husband may be the best heart surgeon in Ontario, he fretted, but obviously he has never worked on someone so small as a tiny... However, this will be a good opportunity to invite both Khalids to meet the family. I hope they love them all as much as I do. Turning off the light, the professor reflected on Louis's life. He has lived five amazing years, he consoled himself. But then he grudgingly admitted, well, maybe the first four weren't so amazing when he lived all alone in the nursery, and probably the first few months he spent caring for 20 young tinies was tough. And things would have been even better if Loretta had survived. But Louis said himself that he thoroughly enjoyed the last seven months. Deep in his heart, however, the professor began to question if he was fair to his own little family. He had given them a beautiful paradise for a short time with minimal suffering. But even the minimal suffering was questionable. He hadn't planned on Louis aging so fast, or Rose's accidental death, or the high heat day when the system shut down, or the life-threatening flood. He knew there were a few negative attitudes that impacted everyone, and Amy was struggling. But for the most part, it's been a success, he argued. Looking at the front cover of Seth's report, which still lay on his lap, he considered the constraint triangle again. God has promised an eternal loving community to those who choose to obey him, he mused. What is my little glimpse of paradise compared to forever? And what would it be like to share God's nature, to be immortal? 
to be read of human nature. Is it possible that I'm the one who is unfair? Nushame, never, he answered himself. I haven't asked my son to die a torturous and humiliating death. I don't sit back and just watch while tragedies occur in paradise, and I certainly don't choose to bring them upon anyone. All the promises in that cursed book are false hopes that delude innocent people. And even if there is a God, I don't think I want anything to do with him. He's far too harsh and unfair. Yet that night, the professor spent several hours staring sleeplessly at the ceiling. Never before had he considered such strong evidence against evolution. And now, after Louis's earnest appeal and the ethic committee's wrangling, he realized his experiment might potentially be more painful to the tiny humans involved than the 50 years he had lived. I wish there was a way to bring the tinies back to my world, he reflected. I wish I could undo what I've done. The sunflower and the butterflies gave me a foolish, fleeting hope that there might be a way for the DNA to revert to its natural state, but I'm quite certain there isn't. He pondered the facts. A successful change in DNA can only occur at the egg and sperm stage with the very first cell. Only a so-called miracle could change every single differentiated cell in a fully grown organism. The measure of despair, he told himself firmly, that isn't feasible or possible outside of foolish supernatural fantasies. It's as impossible as a disfigured leper instantly restored to normalcy or a dead corpse brought back to life. If there's no rational scientific explanation for something, I won't believe it. I can't believe it, regardless of what I see. His own words came back to him. Those who stop at impossible won't make new discoveries. Shaking his head, he told himself such sentiments didn't apply in this situation. <laughs> Chapter 35, First Aid Before heading to bed, Louis searched online for a tutorial course on first aid. He found one that looked helpful and skimmed over it. That's what I'll teach in the morning, he told himself. It was all techniques that he had previously studied, so it didn't take long to refresh his memory. Discouraged that Rosa might never be brought back to life, Louis typed in the name which the professor had inadvertently insinuated was stronger than himself. Before this, he had occasionally come across articles on God and his promises, but only skimmed through them dismissively, believing the professor was the absolute authority on everything. Having read Faith or Fact, An End to Delusion, which had been full of complex arguments he didn't fully understand, he had been convinced that God was a villainous and improbable character devised by a fear-mongering tribe in some ancient culture. However, from various quotations in the professor's own book, he knew that some in the big world felt God held the power of life. Is there any evidence, he pondered eagerly. Regardless of how capricious, genocidal, or megalomaniacal this God character is supposed to be, does he know more about sustaining life than the professor? Desperate for answers, Louis began skimming through numerous extensive articles written both for and against the concept that God existed. He was very intrigued to discover that this God had also written a book. Downloading a Bible app onto the phone, Louis began the first chapter of God's book and read with ever-increasing astonishment. God claimed to have made the whole universe that the professor lived in, not just his planet which Louis knew from previous research was an infinitely greater accomplishment than paradise. If the book were true, this God claimed to have made animals, birds, trees, and fish. He'd even made a man out of the dust and kindly provided him a wife. Louis discovered that in the very first garden, there was also a tree of life. God had thought of everything. Well, fruit from this tree keeps someone from aging, he wondered hopefully. As he read on, he soon realized that the one who claimed to be the creator had expectations, and his creation had disregarded those expectations numerous times. By chapter 6, human beings had become so violent and wicked that God had purposely caused a global flood. Only a few survived. Hmm. 
Hmm. I suppose this is evidence that he is genocidal, Louis reflected thoughtfully. But he did have valid reasons for wiping everyone out. If everyone's imaginations were only evil continually and violence was widespread, I suppose the world was no longer a safe place to live. He pondered the matter carefully. If this book is true, he surmised, it claims that life and death are in the hands of this powerful God, whether we like it or not. So does he know how to restore life to the cells? Louis's eyes were now open to a whole new, highly exciting proposition which he intended to pursue. He only stopped reading when he knew it was time for the next day to begin. A small package came on the train that morning with Louis's name on it. Opening it up, he found the blood pressure monitor. Once he had stored the instrument safely in the cave, he really began the school day with a first aid lesson. Referring to his book propped up on the book holder with a diagram of the human body, Uncle Louis talked about various accidents that could occur and how to help the victim. Seeing that Ponce and Odom were actually at school that morning, even if they were fooling around on the top step, Uncle Louis called Ponce over to demonstrate the lesson. Sometimes we can choke on something like a piece of hard food, he said, holding Ponce's shoulder with one of his hands, and it may become lodged in our windpipe. He pointed out the windpipe in the diagram. Then with Ponce's cooperation, he showed the Tinies how to stand behind the choking victim and bend the person slightly forward. Hit them fairly hard in the back, just between the shoulder blades with your fist, he said, giving Ponce a gentle whack. Ponce overreacted in comical form, but Uncle Louis kept him from completely collapsing on the ground. Do that five times if someone is choking, he told the kids. Then standing behind the young man and putting his arms around him, Uncle Louis taught them how to push up with their hands together in the middle of the abdomen just below the rib cage. You want to push on their windpipe, he explained, pointing to the picture, and pop that choking object out of them. Keep doing these two different actions five times each until the person expels the object from their throat. With dramatic flair, Ponzi pretended he was choking as Uncle Louis went over the steps they were to perform. Everyone laughed at the show. Uncle Louis insisted that they all try the procedures gently on their friends. A number of the Tinies were far too forceful with their attempts, and there were many groans and belches. Some of the young men even got into serious wrestling matches. Wearily, Uncle Louis made everyone sit back down. This is serious, he reminded them earnestly. We're going to talk about how to help someone who has drowned or had a heart attack. If you listen carefully... You will discover what to do to save a life and think twice about distracting the others because one day it may be your life that needs to be saved. While there were some that struggled to calm down, the group in the front were listening intently. Amy's deep blue eyes were very alert. Tina and Kenzie were also looking straight at him. You may come across someone who isn't breathing, Uncle Louie explained, speaking to the keen group. They might have drowned in the water. He looked over at the beach boys and noted he had Damien's attention. Swallowing hard, he then added, Or maybe they don't have a pulse because their heart stopped working, which we call a heart attack. Amy's eyes opened wide. And they may look like they are dead, he explained, but there are some very important procedures to try immediately, which may restart their heart or get their lungs working again. Okay, Ponce, Uncle Louis directed, Lie down on the ground and pretend to be unconscious. Since they had just learned about the dangers of choking, Ponzi made a vivid demonstration of what it might be like to cough to death. With one last gasp for air, he fell to the ground and stretched out limply with his eyes staring blankly into space. Amy couldn't help but think of Rosa. With an anxious gasp, she looked quickly away. She remembered seeing Uncle Louie breathe into Rosa's mouth. Was this the way to get someone's lungs working again? but it hadn't worked. Hardy clapping brought her back to attention. Most of the Tinies love Ponzi's antics, but she noticed that Odin looked pale and distraught and was fiddling anxiously with the stick he held. Lily reached out to place a hand on his arm, but he pushed her away. She looked sad. I'm not the only one still feeling pain, Amy thought. Uncle Louie didn't laugh. He seemed very sober. Waiting until everyone had calmed down and he had Ponzi's cooperation again, he demonstrated how to tilt the head back slightly in order to open the airway. He told them to ensure the victim was flat on their back, and then he explained how to give chest compressions and mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, 
He didn't actually perform any of these on Ponzi, but he got close and made sure everyone had a good understanding of what to do and how it worked. Voices rang out, No way I'm doing that! And oh, that's so disgusting! Don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to try this on each other, he assured everyone. Amy waved her hand in the air as a new passion began to emerge inside. After months of feeling that she had caused Rose's death and having nearly drowned in the big waves herself, saving a life was something she fervently hoped she could do. Yes, Amy, Uncle Louis acknowledged. Please, Uncle Louis, she begged. Please, can I come up and go through that with you? I want to make sure I know how to do it right. Smiling, he agreed. Look out, Ponzi, Odin jeered. Ponzi covered his mouth awkwardly and opened his eyes wide in alarm. Many of the others laughed. Amy was slightly embarrassed, but she smiled kindly in Odin's direction. She sensed he was reliving some difficult memories, just as she was. I'm not really going to do it, she laughed. At least not the mouth-to-mouth part. While the jesting continued, Amy asked Uncle Louie to show her exactly how to hold her hands together to press on Ponzi's chest. She listened carefully when he pointed out exactly where she was to push. Tina and Yuyan came closer to watch as well. Zaheer, Georgia, and Kenzie followed. Your goal is to press on Ponzi's heart, Uncle Louie told them, and make it pump the blood. He pointed to the diagram in the book and showed them where Ponzi's heart would likely be. Ponzi covered his chest. No, no, not my heart, he begged, kicking his legs. Ignoring Ponzi's silly antics, Uncle Louie told the girls, If Ponzi was not breathing, you would do 30 compressions quickly, then blow into his mouth, make sure his chest rises and falls, and blow one more time, then 30 more compressions, then two more breaths. When would I stop? Amy asked. When he comes back to life and starts breathing on his own, Uncle Louie told her kindly or when you are too tired to do it anymore. It doesn't always work, she asked thoughtfully. Uncle Louis shook his head slowly. But it's definitely always worth trying as long as you can. You could extend someone's life for a little bit longer. Then he mumbled, and maybe give him more time to figure things out. Pardon? Amy asked, unsure of what he had said. But Uncle Louis just smiled and shook his head. Seeing that all those who had gathered around him were eager to understand the process, he went through it with them one more time. When the first aid lesson was over, lunch wasn't quite ready. With the big oven in the kitchen still broken down, the Tawnies were having fun baking their own bread outside. Every group that had a working box oven put in their ball of dough. Being quite familiar now with how long the baking took, Amy and Kenzie helped their partners with the parabolic cooker. It was quite complicated, and since Uncle Louis had other lessons to teach every day, no one had worked on the project for a while. They hadn't quite finished assembling all the pieces when the lunch bell jingled. Leaving their project on the schoolhouse deck, Amy and Kenzie divided up their loaf of fresh, hot bread with their group. Amy was just about to eat her portion when she noticed that Odin was pulling a very burnt loaf out of his cooker. Nancy and Damien had been over-talking with Vanitha's group, and they were horrified. You said you were going to keep an eye on it, Nancy reprimanded. That was your one job, Damien criticized. Now we have nothing for lunch. Other groups offered to share with Nancy and Damien. Uncle Louie looked up with a smile. Kenzie and Amy glanced at each other. I'll give Odin mine, Amy offered. Then I'll share with you, Kenzie nodded. Odin just shrugged when Amy handed him her piece of the loaf. She spoke to him kindly. That life-saving lesson we had today was hard on me. Was it also hard on you? I'm so sorry you lost, Rosa. I don't care about anybody, Odin growled. But thanks for the bread. 